Hello, that's right, we're back. <laughs> um, this is a Bite Size Learning from the Ohio Academy of Family Physicians. I am Dr. Mike Savillo, um, OEFP president, and a really exciting uh, topic that we have uh, coming up uh, this evening. And we're just going to kind of really uh, dive into it. Our, uh, the title is uh, The Aging Spine, and we have uh, Dr. Robert Ryu from uh, Orthopedic One uh, to present that to us this evening. And just to let everybody know, this uh, session is sponsored by Orthopedic One. and We definitely thank them for their support of OEFB programming. So, uh, Dr. Ryu, thank you so much for being here and uh, take it away. And I'll see you afterward for questions. So thank Great. you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I will share my screen here now. All right. So, uh, again, my name is Robert Ryu. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon with Orthopedic One, and today I'll be giving a presentation on the aging spine. Uh, first part of my talk, I will go over my background, where I come from, and my training background. Um, so, I'm originally from the San Francisco Bay Area. I did my undergraduate studies at the University of California, Berkeley. I uh, did my medical school at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where I joined the US Air Force uh, through the Health Profession Scholarship Program. Um, I went on to do a year of general surgery training, <clears throat> excuse me, at UC Davis and Travis Air Force Base. Uh, I then spent a few years in the active duty Air Force uh, as an F-16 flight surgeon. Um, and then when I left active duty, I joined the Ohio Toledo Air National Guard, um, where I still currently serve as a traditional guardsman. In terms of my training background, I did my residency in orthopedic surgery at Ohio State University. I then went on to do my uh, spine surgery fellowship at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. And this was a combined orthopedic and neurosurgical fellowship. And one of the real highlights of our fellowship is that it, it's touted as being the minimally invasive spine surgery fellowship but the way i really think of it is it was the motion preservation spine surgery fellowship and i'll, I'll go into what that means exactly when, when i talk about various surgical techniques but we i received a lot of training in both minimally invasive techniques but also in, in newer techniques uh, that involve motion preserving spine surgery so <clears throat> again my talk is called the aging spine some background back pain we all know is very common. It's the one one of the most common causes of disabilities, a disability in Americans less than uh, 45. Uh, it's one of the most common reasons for a visit to a physician for a chronic condition. Uh, lifetime prevalence is over 60 percent and neck pain is similarly common. Uh, we also know what this looks like, the aging process. Um, as we grow in age um, in our earlier years, um, our spine also lengthens and we grow in height and we peak somewhere in our early adulthood. And then as we age, we actually start losing height and uh, that's due to changes um, in our body, namely in our spine. And this process is inevitable. So what does that look like um, actually in the spine? Uh, these are multiple cross sections of normal uh, intervertebral discs all the way down to severely degenerative discs. Um, and so again, this is the juvenile disc to the adult disc um, and then to the severely degenerative disc. And this process is described by the Thompson criteria where early on you get a loss of cells, uh, lose, uh, the discs lose water, they lose proteoglycans, you get collagen changes uh, with a decrease in type two collagen and then an increase in type one collagen. You get annular fissures or the outer annulus of the disc start to fissure and tear and um, over time, the disc loses its mechan mechanical competence and its support of the disc space. Um, and then eventually, as this begins or as this progresses in its collapse, you get bony changes with end plate, end plate sclerosis, osteophyte formation, cystic formation, etc. And if this process goes on for long enough, eventually these two bones will fuse together. What does that look like on MRI? Um, the first sign of degenerative disc disease is very subtle. If you look at the height of this disc compared to the, the two adjacent discs, it's, it loses a little bit of height. One of the next things that happens is that the discs start to lose water. On this sequence of MRI, water is bright. 
this is a T2 um, uh, image sequence, MRI sequence. And one of the first things that ha happens along with uh, the disc losing its height is that it loses water. And so the disc starts to turn black. And then in the severe case, the, the disc will collapse. Um, you'll, you may get a degenerative slip, you get thickening of the ligamentum flavum in back, um, and you get bony changes, all leading to severe compression of the nerve roots that run through the spinal canal here. Uh, <clears throat> so there are various conditions um, that affect the spine. And uh, just to go over some basics, uh, the axial skeleton as shown here is uh, divided up into multiple regions. And, and the spine itself is divided up into three regions, and really four, the cervical, the thoracic, the lumbar, and then below the lumbar is the, the sacrum. Um, axial pain, meaning pain that comes from the axial skeleton, really can occur anywhere within those regions of the spine. Radiculopathy similarly can occur in any of those regions. Uh, but myelopathy, which is a very different condition, really only occurs at the cervical, uh, or excuse me, at the spinal cord level uh, in the cervical and thoracic um, spine. So here are two common images that we see. Um, on the left here is a uh, disc herniation. Uh, and this, this looks like this is in the lumbar spine. This is the central canal. And there's a disc that's herniated out. This tends to occur in younger patients with a more sudden onset with radiating pain down the legs if it's in the lumbar spine or down the arms in the, in the cervical spine, worse with sitting. This image here on the right is a picture of um, spinal stenosis where you have a broad disc bulge and thickening of the ligaments and flavum here all um, causing stenosis of the spinal canal. This all, uh, this all around tends to occur in older uh, patients with a more gradual onset and this can be associated with radiating pain down the arms or legs, um, often worse with standing and walking. So the differential for neck or back pain is pretty wide. Um, it could be something as simple as an, a muscular strain, a disc herniation, spondylosis, um, meaning degenerative disc disease or arthritic facet joints, spinal stenosis, spondylolisthesis, which is a slip vertebrae. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, deformities such as kyphosis or scoliosis. Um, but it could be something more serious such as fracture, infection, or tumor. Um, an important concept to understand is the difference between neck and lower back pain. So here's a, a, a total body um, sagittal cut of uh, MRI um, showing the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine. Um, here's the brain with the brain stem and then the spinal cord, this gray structure coming all the way down. And the spinal cord ends at the level of around L1 in most individuals. Um, so uh, issues that affect the neck can involve the spinal cord, but um, lower back problems tend not to affect the actual spinal cord. So again, going back to those two images that I showed earlier, um, this is another illustration of what a disc herniation looks like. Um, this is a normal appearing disc with an outer annulus made up of type 1 collagen and an inner nucleus pulposus um, with a more gelatinous inner core that's made up of more type 2 type collagen. Um, <clears throat> and often uh, what happens with disc herniations is, is that you get a tear in the outer lining of, of the discs and the, the inner nucleus pulposus uh, herniates out and impinges on the actual nerve roots. Here's a neural foramen with the nerve roots coming out and um, multiple sort of uh, views showing this disc herniating out, uh, impinging on the nerve root. But it's not just the impingement of the nerve root, um, it's also the, um, this process is also highly inflammatory. And this, when this occurs in the lumbar spine, um, um, leads to what we think of as sciatica or what we describe as sciatica. So again, in the lumbar spine, it's associated with leg pain, weakness, and numbness. If it occurs in the cervical spine, it's associated with radiating pain down the arms, usually with a more sudden, severe onset. Uh, but it doesn't have to be related to an injury. And all around, it's more common in younger patients. Again, in that second image that I initially showed um, of spinal stenosis, Here's another illustration showing a normal um, spinal segment with a normal spinal canal. Um, and in this image here, there's sort of a broad disc bulge with some 
arthritic changes, facet arthrosis, some thickening of the ligaments and flavum that leads to a narrowing of the spinal canal. More commonly occurs in the neck or in the lower back, tends not to occur in the uh, thoracic spine. Generally, conditions don't occur in the thoracic spine um, um, because the thoracic spine is stabilized by the rib cage. But it occurs in the cervical spine, as shown here. This is a sagittal cut of the cervical spine showing multiple areas of severe compression um, from cervical spinal stenosis of the cervical uh, um, um, spinal cord. And that can lead to a condition called myelopathy, and which is a neurologic condition characterized by unsteady gait, loss of hand dexterity, and fine motor disturbances. So I'll often ask patients, um, do you feel sort of, how's your balance? Do you feel unsteady on your feet? Do you feel drunk on your feet? Um, how, how's your hand dexterity? Are you having difficulty buttoning shirts, writing, picking up coins? Are you dropping items? F folks will say they, uh, say that they, they feel like they're losing coordination or they're losing smooth motion of their extremities, what's called spasticity. Um, unfortunately, this condition is progressive with age and um, is an indication for surgery. And unfortunately, in many older patients, this goes unrecognized because, again, folks sort of attribute these sort of changes, which are often subtle, uh, to being just old age. <clears throat> When spinal stenosis occurs in the lumbar spine, it leads to a condition called neurogenic claudication. Um, and patients will classically uh, describe difficulty with standing for prolonged periods of time or going on long walks. Uh, they'll describe back pain, leg pain, um, bilateral leg pain with numbness and tingling and weakness, a sensation of heaviness or a dull ache. Um, generally, immediately better when they sit or rest. Um, feels better when they lean forward over a shopping cart. Or, uh, or some sort of stationary object. This is what we call the positive shopping cart sign. Um, it's important to distinguish this from vascular claudication, which can present very similarly. So again, it's important to do a good thorough exam and actually uh, um, do a peripheral vascular exam. Uh, lumbar spondylolisthesis, which is a slip vertebrae of one in relation to the next, can present very similarly with difficulty with standing, walking for prolonged periods of time with back pain, bilateral leg pain, numbness, and or weakness. Um, patients um, may complain of uh, pain with transitional movements, meaning going from sitting to standing, standing to laying down, um, um, pain in their back with these movements, especially in the dynamic setting. Deformity, um, this is an example of degenerative scoliosis, can be progressive. Um, can affect not only your coronal alignment, but also your sagittal alignment. And this is often associated with severe back pain, um, plus or minus nerve pain as well. So your treatment options really boils down to two broad categories, non-operative and operative. Here on the left, um, go over some non-operative treatment options, um, starting out with conservative therapy. And the good news is the vast majority of spine conditions, 90 plus percent of spine issues can be treated conservatively with physical therapy, manipulations, activity modification, acupuncture, anti-inflammatory medication, et cetera. Um, beyond that, pain management, so trying epidural steroid injections, facet blocks, rhizotomies, even intrathecal pumps. Um, and then surgery. And spine surgery really can be brought up, uh, broken up into um, four broad categories. Uh, decompression, decompression with fusion, uh, disc replacements, and, and I'll go into a little bit more of other motion preserving techniques, and then cement augmentation, which comes in the form of kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty. A really important thing to understand is that the, the vast majority of spine procedures are elective. And really what it boils down to is it's a quality of life decision for folks. Because unfortunately, oftentimes the risks of surgery may outweigh the benefits of surgery. Um, similarly, um, um, <clears throat> uh, spine surgery can, can vary broadly in terms of uh, being very minimally invasive to maximally invasive. And here's an example of uh, a minimally invasive tubular um, discectomy or decompression, where this is probably like a 16 or less than 20 millimeter tube that's dilated through the muscle with minimal uh, soft tissue dissection um, and 
in this procedure, probably doing a discectomy or some sort of decompression using our microscope. Um, and then here on the right, this is an example of a T9 to pelvis fusion, instrumented fusion. Um, uh, similarly, your, your indications can be, um, can vary uh, broadly um, anywhere between, or being minimally necess necessary to maximally necessary. Um, but <clears throat> most spine surgery for, uh, involves some form of decompressing the nerves in the spinal cord um, and uh, plus or minus stabilizing the spine if needed. So I've alluded to motion preserving techniques. Here are two examples of motion preserving techniques. Here on the left is an example of a lumbar disc replacement. And this is an actual pro disc uh, implant where the, uh, the disease disc is removed and either the central canal, the neural foramen are decompressed. And instead of putting in a fusion device, you actually replace it with a device that's, in this case, this is a pro disc, a device that is meant to mimic the function and motion of that disc. Um, so in, in this example, uh, this disc can still bend forward and backwards and sideways and even rotate. Here on the right is an example of a posterior cervical laminoplasty where the spinal cord is decompressed and um, each level the lamina are stabilized with these plates, but these levels aren't fused together. Um, really the, the, the sort of genesis for these motion preserving techniques is comes from um, um, uh, looking for a, a, a technique to address the, the, the problem with fusion, which is adjacent segment disease. This is one of the most um, well-quoted studies in the spine literature by Alan Hillebrand, uh, which found that after a fusion, the rate of adjacent segment disease is about 2.9% per year, meaning 10 years out from a fusion operation, about 20 to 30% of patients need the next level fuse. Because when you fuse a segment in your spine, what you're doing is you're taking away that motion and the adjacent levels above and below have to make up for that lost motion. So um, those levels wear out faster than they would have otherwise. Uh, there's plenty of data out there in, in the cervical spine that have shown that cervical disc replacements um, have shown to reduce the rates of adjacent segment disease. Um, and even more recently, um, uh, this is one of the papers by my, one of my fellowship mentors, Todd Lamb, and it, this is one of the FDA ID clinical trials looking at two-level cervical disc replacements versus two-level fusion and looking at the 10-year data, uh, finding that not only is there lower adjacent segment disease and reoperation at the adjacent levels, but overall higher patient satisfaction outcomes, better alignment, uh, quicker recovery and healing. Um, similarly, in the lumbar literature, there's plenty of data that supports um, um, disc replacements uh, over fusion in terms of reducing the rates of adjacent segment disease and better range of motion, better alignment, faster healing. Uh, again, with a, with a fusion, um, you're waiting for those bones to fuse together. So it's, it's all around a longer recovery and you're taking away that segment of motion. So the other levels have to make up for that lost motion leading to higher rates of adjacent segment disease. What we call that in the spine literature is, is um, the, the fusion cascade. So when you fuse a segment of your spine over time, five, seven years later, you need to uh, fuse the next level. And then another five, seven, 10 years later, the next level needs to be fused and you start marching up the spine. And, um, um, and uh, disc replacements, both cervical and lumbar have been shown to reduce the rates of these. Um, <clears throat> all around it's newer technology, especially around here um, in, in Ohio, uh, folks have been doing cervical disc replacements for a little while now, probably several 10 years or so um, here. This technology has been in America for about 20 years. It's been in Europe for about 30 years. Um, and just to show an animation of what it looks like, here's a video of a cervical disc that's degenerative, impinging on the nerve root. That disc is removed and it's replaced with a disc replacement device. This is a pro disc. There's different types of implants on the market right now, but generally has some sort of metal base plate with some sort of plastic piece in between with sort of a ball and socket kind of design that allows um, one to still sort of bend, uh, flex and extend and rotate their neck. Um, and then this is 
uh, an example of a two-level lumbar disc replacement where again the degenerative discs are removed the nerves are decompressed and instead of placing the placing in a fusion device you replace them with in this case this is an example of a pro disc That allows the patient still to bend and um, move through those segments um, of the spine. This, the idea of uh, uh, spine disc replacements is is very analogous um, to hip and knee replacements. A long time ago, um, if you had a bad hip or a bad knee, you'd you'd have your hip or knee fused, um, and you'd walk around with a leg that didn't work very well. I mean. The reason why we can get away with fusion in the spine is because you have five discs in your lumbar spine and five discs in your neck, and so those other levels can make up for that lost motion. But all around, the principles are still there that uh, still apply in that that disc is meant to move, the facet joints in the back are meant to move. Um, and so all around, um, this is the preferred technique if, if, um, if it's indicated. But sometimes fusion is necessary, and the, the indications for this are in, any sort of instability or progressive deformity. And this is an example of, of a large degenerative scoliotic curve um, that um, for which a uh, patient underwent a T9 to pelvis instrumented fusion. Um, and the goal of this surgery really is to prevent the progression. You hope to correct some of that deformity, but really to prevent the progression of it. So. Um, in conclusion, there are many different issues in the neck and the lower back, back that can affect you and your patients. And the key to really is to make the right diagnosis uh, because the decision is based on patient's wishes for in most cases, but there are certain conditions uh, um, that do require surgery, such as uh, cervical myelopathy. Uh, and there have also been many advances in uh, surgical techniques that have minimized morbidity while maximizing outcomes. Um, such as minimally invasive decompressions, uh, even minimally invasive uh, fusion operations and motion preserving techniques such as disc replacements and laminoplasty. So with that, I will conclude and take any questions. Well, great, Jim. Thank you for that. Uh Great information there. I, there's just a couple of questions before we close. Sure. And the first one, you probably get this a lot, and I get this a lot too with my patients. Is and you address this a little bit when you talked about adjacent vertebrae. But I have patients ask me a lot, you know, who's even hesitant to consider surgery. Like if you start the surgery process, whether it's in the neck or in the lower back, that eventually you're going to need further surgery. How do you address that when patients ask you that? Uh, I tell them that definitely a risk factor for uh, fusion operation that, you know, I, I quote those numbers right off the bat too. And I say that it happens two to 3% per year. Um, is it a guarantee? No. Um, there's many patients out there who undergo a fusion and, and do fine and don't ever need another operation. Um, and everyone's a little bit different and it depends on why they're getting that fusion because if, is it, um, you know, we can go into all the nitpicky details of, of you know, is it for dynamic, um, unstable spondylolisthesis, or is it for a fracture situation, or is it um, uh, for framal stenosis, et cetera? There's, there's, there's many different reasons why a patient has um, needs a fusion or may get a fusion. Um, and the other thing that may predispose them to requiring fusion in the, uh, at the adjacent levels in the future is how did the disc look at those levels already? Um, and I counsel patients on, on those numbers and, and say, you know what, if, if, if we do the operation, you know, it's, it's not a guarantee that you're going to need the next level of fuse over time. If you take care of your back like you would, you sh you would otherwise, um, um, keeping your core strong, doing physical therapy, eating healthy and doing all the right things that, you know, you, you would minimize your risk of that. Uh, and I guess my last question is, and, and I know you, you know, uh, definitely you go through this with your patients is, you know, before going into surgery, how do you set up like the expectations for patients as far as, you know, how much, you know, pain improvement are they going to have following surgery? How much function are they going to have following surgery? Because, you know, I have, I have a lot of patients that ask me, they do have realistic expectations even before they see you. How do you set up those 
expectations for pain and function uh, when you're talking about surgery with your patients? Right. I, um, all around, um, relief of back pain is hard to predict. I, I, I tell patients that all the time because back pain is, is very nebulous sometimes. Leg pain tends to be a lot easier to predict depending on the pathology. If there's, if there's clear pathology that correlates with their imaging with, um, for example, they have a, a disc herniation that appears to be impinging the L5 nerve root, they get an L5 injection and their pain went away temporarily, it comes back. We say, okay, that predicts pretty well that your, that leg pain is gonna get better. We'll take away all of your back pain, that's, that's less predictable. Um, in terms of, it, it all depends on their, their pathology. So I, I, I really sort of cater to, to uh, in answering those questions or sort of setting expectations to, to the individual. Because if I think, you know what, they have a lot of back pain because they have this dynamic spondylolisthesis. If we stabilize it, then I expect that a significant amount of the back pain will improve. Then I'll set that expectation. Um, the other thing too that's um, worth noting is, is you know, how's their pain preoperatively? What are they on? Um, are they already on narcotics? Are they in pain management? Um, some more recent literature suggests that if you can if you can wean off of their narcotics preoperatively, then the chance of them needing narcotics long term postoperatively is significantly reduced. Um, so that's another thing that I I, I talk about and address with them, um, but. Uh, all around, leg pain is a lot easier to predict in terms of um, relief of pain. Postoperatively, back pain is less predictable. So, but I think every every individual is a little bit different all around based on their pathology. Uh, and do we we do have a question from Facebook, and I'll read it. And maybe we'll be able to bring it up on the screen from Dr. Palazzo. What factors do you consider for disc replacement surgery, i.e., osteoporosis, compression, etc.? Um. So in the um, lumbar spine, uh, the classic indication really is discogenic back pain, which sometimes is hard to diagnose. Um, and it really, and so a couple, a couple of things, um, someone who doesn't have significant um, instability, deformity, no osteopenia or osteoporosis, um, those are all contraindications for doing a disc replacement. Um, in the lumbar spine too, if, uh, we, we look at certain um, parameters in terms of measurements of angles and things like that. And if they're outside of the parameters and then they're not a candidate for it, if there are any PARS fractures, because what we're not replacing um, in, the, in a di lumbar disc replacement are the facet joints in the back. So if, if the facet joints are really arthritic or if there are PARS fractures, and you do a disc replacement fund, you may cause more problems. And really, that patient should get a fusion. Um, all around, I, I, I tend to think of um, doing disc replacements more in younger patients all around. So someone I'm thinking about doing an anterior cervical discectomy and fusion versus disc replacement, if they're a younger patient with good motion, without any significant um, deformity, then I'll, I'll try to err on the side of doing a um, uh, disc replacement. Um, um, so age is a factor too, because sort of setting up a young patient for fusion and potentially setting them up for, for fusion in the, at the adjacent levels in the future is, is, is something I think about because when we think about those numbers that it occurs at a rate of about two to 3% per year. Um, let's see, those are the main, the main things that I consider. Cool, cool. Thanks, Kurt, for the question there. Um, so, Dr. Roy, but before we close things up, uh, do you have any uh, closing thoughts uh, for our audience tonight and maybe some we didn't touch on or, or something uh, that came to mind during your presentation as we uh, close up our conversation tonight? Um, no, just, just to emphasize that, you know, spine surgery gets a, a bad rap. Um, so we've all heard of those patients who have undergone a fusion and just had chronic pain and required multiple operations and and, and spine is evolving. There's a, a lot of new techniques out there um, to address um, spinal pathologies that are not, you know, in my last point of my, in my concluding slide, that there have been many advances recently in more minimally invasive techniques uh, that minimize morbidity and maximize outcomes. Um, 
And, you know, I'm just thinking about a, a handful of patients I've had recently that I've done some minimally invasive fusion decompressions on that gone home the next day, could have gone home the same day. And, you know, if we, if we did the, those operations in the more traditional way, if we do spine surgery, uh, big open decompressions and fusions and things like that, and then patients would stay longer, um, uh, require more narcotic use, have more post-operative pain. And again, doing bigger open incisions predisposes the, is one of the other elements or factors that um, probably plays into adjacent segment disease that develops over time. Great. Yeah, before we close up here, uh, Dr. Ryu, if people want to uh, contact you or your office, uh, where people uh, might be able to uh, uh, reach out to you. Um, so I am located at Orthopedic One on the west side of Columbus in Upper Arlington at 4605 Sawmill Road, uh, Upper Arlington 43220. And um, I operate primarily out of Dublin Methodist Hospital and Riverside Methodist Hospital. Uh, we have a surgery center um, on site in Upper Arlington as well. And then I'm also an adjunct uh, professor at Ohio State University as well. Cool, cool. And people can certainly get more information at orthopedicone.com. And we certainly thank Orthopedic One uh, for sponsoring tonight's session. And of course, always supporting programming for the Ohio Academy of Family Physicians. So that uh, ends our session tonight for Bite Size Learning. So, uh, and we will uh, see you next time. Obviously, if you're listening live and you missed any of this, you can get the uh, archived uh, session at ohioafp.org. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you again, Dr. Ryu, and uh, have a good night, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.